تو ولا يقتب بعضكم بعضا أيحب أحدكم أن يأكل لحم أخيه ميتا فكرهتموه واتقوا الله إن الله تواب رحيم Verse number 12, Surat Hujurat. O oh, believers, avoid having too much suspicion, as some of the suspicions are blatant sins. Do not spy and prey on each other, and no one should indulge in backbiting. Would anyone like to eat the flesh of his dead brother? You detest it. Uh, remind yourself of Allah, and Allah is the most forgiving and most merciful. Before I begin discussing the point raised in at least the, this verse and early Surat Hujurat, I want to have a brief recap of the discussion we had last night. The theme last night, I'm sure you do remember, was the significance of Tawbah, and particularly sincere Tawbah, Tawbat Nasuh, and the consequence of Tawbat Nasuh in our behavior, in our lifestyle, and everything else. I mentioned that there are two pivotal conditions for Tawbat Nasuh, the sincere Tawbah, without these conditions, with in absence of these conditions, would negate the concept of toba completely. Number one was the regret of the past. We reflect on the past and we see what we have done. We haven't achieved anything and we become regretful of the time, life. Remember that our life is a blessing to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the day of judgment, when we stand before Allah, we will be questioned. How did we spend the time? How did we spend our life? Uh, among other things that we will be questioned. So regret of the past is one of the pivotal conditions needed for Tawbat Nasuh. And the second one, Al-Azm, clear determination that we are not going to go back. And also I mentioned last night, for the younger generation is much easier to achieve this this uh, Tawbat Nasuh, the sincere uh, repentance, because sinfulness has not established itself in their heart. Unfortunately for the seniors like myself, that we have spent huge life with uh, sub not submitting to the command of Allah, and hardened heart, which I mentioned last night about this, it's very hard to get Tawbat Nasuh and uh, make a clear determination that we are not going to go back. Also, on the periphery of the points that I discussed was the effect of sin on our souls and on our hearts. Rawayat, ahadith exist that they talk about uh, how, metaphorically speaking, the heart of a human being, being like a clear glass or a mirror. And every sin that we commit leaves a scratch or a mark on that clear uh, glass or mirror that we have, which we call it in some of the narratives of the ahadith, fitra. The purity of the birth. But what happens is the upbringing and the condition, the environment, the nurture-nature relationship that uh, ultimately affects uh, the life and uh, the, uh, the line, the, the, the path that we choose in our life. Uh, so it's critical that we pay attention uh, and according to verses in the Holy Quran as well as a hadith, if we don't pay attention and we don't submit to Allah, we continue using, becoming, being sinful, ultimately our heart reaches a point that becomes non-responsive, non-receptive, and Quran says, kal hijara. It's a rock as hard as a rock. And in the in the verse that I mentioned last night, Quran says, at least from rocks, sometimes it cracks and water gushes out. But the heart of human being, which is supposed to be the best 
uh, cream of the, the creation, it becomes so hard that does not respond to Allah whatsoever. There is another verse in the Holy Quran. It says, "Istahwada alayhim al-shaytan fa'ansahum dhikrullah. Shaytan like a mold holds their heart and they don't remember Allah at all. And this is uh, really critical. Uh, just imagine going back to Karbala, for example. On the day of Karbala, two groups of people were there. Both of them claimed to be Muslims. Both of them are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One camp, Umar ibn Sa'd leading the prayer. On other camp, Imam Hussein is leading the prayer. When Umar ibn Sa'd's camp finished the prayer, Umar ibn Sa'd encouraged the people to go, get ready and move to kill the grandson of the Holy Prophet because they are outlaws. Ghulat. And this is within what? 50 years of the demise of the Holy Prophet. Shimr was among the disciples of Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa in Safin. And he was injured. If uh, he would have killed, would have been killed in the battle of Safin, we would have included his name with the shuhada uh, now. A number of times he went barefooted from Medina to Mecca for Hajj. And then failed the test. This is something that we really need to pay attention to. That uh, sinfulness is something we really should not entertain it at all before it gets too hard. And finally, I recited a hadith from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, sallallahu wa sallam, one day. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when somebody, an abd or a servant, uh, actually goes through the uh, sincere tawbah, Allah loves him or her. And when Allah loves this person who has repented sincerely, Allah is going to wipe all the sins of the past because there is a clear determination that this person is not going to go back. Wipe the sins of the past completely. So the slate will be cleaned up. This is something that we have to pay attention to. Tonight, we're going to go back to the verse that I started earlier and see what does this verse trying to tell us. It says, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu. Again, the structure, linguistic structure is a command. Whenever you see something in Quran that begins with Ya ayyuhalladina amanu or a uh, little bit after the command comes, it, de uh, it designates or delineates wujub and command. So, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu ujtanibu kathiran min al-dhan. Avoid too much suspicion. Because some of these suspicions are blatant sins. Strangely enough, this verse comes within a context of the uh, number of verses earlier in Surah Hujarat that primarily focuses on the social structure of the Muslim community. How they should behave towards each other. And they should avoid anything that damages the social relationship and creates discontent. So the first one is the issue of uh, too much suspicion. You read too much into something which is, is not there. Unfortunately, digging dirt about each other to find an excuse to damage one's character or demean somebody, it, it has become part and parcel of our society. The next one, وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضًا That backbiting should be avoided. Because all of these characters are part of the characteristics that ultimately damages and destabilize the relationship. But in Surah Al-Hujurat, 11 to 13, Muslims are advised to refrain from all kinds of activities which create hatred and fractures the social structure and social order because it pain, uh, points out or singles out sus suspicion or backbiting, it's only what we call the tip of the iceberg. It's trying to remind us of a unique class 
of behavior that falls under what we call the weakness or, uh, or uh, disease of the tongue. And this is something, not only in Islam, we pay a huge amount of attention to Orafa, the mystics, and so on, uh, the, the huge literature. We see it even in other faiths. If you go back to commentaries on James, for example, in Christianity, you have all of these, again, sometimes even closer narratives to, to the one we have uh, regarding the effect of a sin or a sick tongue and how do we tame it and control uh, this tongue. Ghiba and backbiting here uh, also reveals that uh, the sickness of the tongue has to be dealt with as soon as possible. How do we deal with it? Because it damages the social relationship on the one hand, and it also damages our own spirituality uh, and uh, the inside of our heart, uh, which has become a major issue of, during the month of Ramadan. Uh, how do we uh, purify ourselves, detoxify ourselves, not only from a physical point of view, but also the spiritual point of view? The, the, there are a number of metaphors in our language, our literature, that even uses the metaphor of a wild beast for the tongue. Amir al-Mu'mineen, salawatullah, salam It says that ta'nu al-lisan amassu min ta'n al-sanan. Just pay attention. The wounds inflicted by the tongue are more hurtful than the wounds inflicted by spears or swords. Why? Because wounds inflicted by swords or spears gradually heals and you may have a little bit of mark on skin finished. But the wounds, they, uh, because uh, backbiting and language dig deep into the heart of the individual and not easily repairable. The person who has been uh, the victim feels bitter for a long, long, long time. One of the problems that we have in marital relationship these days in inability of the, the, the both parties to communicate and particularly this inability to control the language, to control the tongue and being disrespectful to each other. And you, by deliberately or by accident, cool-blooded or otherwise, you say something that the other party gets aggrieved and they are not prepared to let go of what happened. Some of the uh, problems that we have, the, the tongue becoming the source of it, abusing and cursing, making fun of other people, lying, Backbiting, slander, swearing, bragging, enlisting others to sin, encouraging others to, to sin, gossiping. These are some of the characteristics that fall under the category of what we call the sin, the, the sick tongue that we really need to pay attention to. Uh, next, the tongue is sometimes referred to al-lisana, al-lisano sab'ba. In an Akar. It's a wild beast. If you let loose, you don't control it, you don't tame it, it bites. The art of communication these days, both unfortunately, you, you should even go and read some of this. The issue of taming the, the tongue has become a theme, part of the human psychology and academic environment, as well as the spiritual. Both of them focus on it. How can we tame it? Number one is to apply a break, and this is critical. Our lifestyle is such that we, are, we have a knee-jerk reaction to talking, and we only stop talking when the, we either don't have anything to say or there is no one, nobody around. Just think about having this gadget in your hand, as soon as the first message comes in, there is an urge, uncontrollable urge, that I have to immediately respond. Spend 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and follow the herd. Whatever they are being said, I follow it without thinking. 
Uh, there is a verse in the Holy Quran that on the day of ju judgment, there are people who are going to, to, uh, to be punished. Say, what, why are you here? The herd, wherever they took us, we followed without being able to use our rationale. So whatever line of conversation they started, we have, uh, have to make a comment without stepping back and finding out, is this worthy of communicating? Is it uh, something that I should be part of it? Is this riba? Is it tuhma? Is it slander? Whatever it is. And I shouldn't be involved. So applying a break means literally changing the style of communication, focusing on sukut and sumt, unless there is something needed to be said. This is a, a polar opposite to when what we have today. What we have today is we immediately talk and talk and talk. We stop when either we have run out of anything to say or there is nobody to talk to. Sumt alaykum, this is the, the hadith from the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, alaykum. Alaykum bitul as sumt. Fa innahu matradatun lish shaytan wa aunun lakum ala amradinakum. Choose the path to silence. When you are silent, and you don't say anything, ulama and orafa and mystical figures and uh, spe uh, specialists, they recommended this kind of uh, strategy from beginning of Raja in preparation for month of Ramadan. Assumed was one of their recommendations, that you get into a habit of not saying anything unless it was necessary. So the Holy Prophet says, Alaykum bitul as long silence. Why? Because fa innahu matradatun lil shaytan, it kicks or distances the shaytan from you and protects your faith. But once you unintentionally, habitually, you get into this conversation without thinking about it, then it is very difficult to step back and say, okay, what am I saying? They are doing riba, I'm part of it. Uh, blessed is the one who speaks good or keeps silent. Either you say very little and uh, say it good or stay silent. Uh, Amir al muminin there is a hadith from Amir al muminin sallallahu alayhi wa He said, I wish... I wish I had a, a neck as long as a camel, metaphorically speaking. Why? From the moment that the word is going to come out and travel this distance, it's a time that I st start thinking. Am I saying the right thing? Or is it uh, sub submission to the command of Allah? Does it agree with the command of Allah, etc., etc.? So when you are silent and you only talk, Applying break, changing the lifestyle. That's number one. Number two, also I want to remind you, listening to people who backbite and you don't say anything about it, you are part of the sin that they are committing. So uh, if you don't stop them. Number two, think about going back to what we discussed last night. Think about the damage to our heart and soul of these sins. That ultimately is going to, if the month of Ramadan is su supposed to be the month that ultimately we achieve purification and taqwa, all of these behaviors and activities would damage and stop us from reaching that end because it affects our soul. Never try to do it by yourself. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be part of this dynamic and provide you with the assistance. There is, uh, regarding this idea of uh, the person who, is, who hears uh, the other, other people uh, backbiting and says nothing, there is a hadith from, from the Holy Prophet وسلم, in which Amir al muminin asked, and his, um, had, the Holy Prophet says, Ya Abul Hassan, 
I have translated, leave the Arabic part. When someone hears the backbiting of his brothers or sisters, committed in his presence and does nothing despite being capable of stopping it. God shall humiliate him in this world and the hereafter for being part of this uh, uh, sin, committing of the sin. Remember one thing else. People who come to you and backbite about others, they take your shortcoming and they go somewhere else. The hadith says, Man namma laka namma alik. There's nothing safe. If a person habitually tries to discredit, assassinate the character of somebody else. By the way, here it's nece necessary to explain what we mean by backbiting and riba. Abadar uh, asks the Holy Prophet to define what is the backbiting. And the Holy Prophet says, is to say something about another person, uh, character, and in, with, a, with the intention of demeaning that person. Abadar asks, what about if these characters that we talk about, that person has it? For example, we say that he is a cheat or he is a liar or something else. The Holy Prophet responds, he says, if when he has it and you say it in that person's absence, try to demean him, is riba. If he, if, he didn't, if he did not have it, it's a backbite, it's not backbiting, it's slander. It's a totally different category of sin. Uh, there is even a hadith uh, from uh, one of the wives of the Holy Prophet that said one day a lady came to see the Holy Prophet and she happened to be uh, short in, in height. So when she left, I, without saying any, anything, I turned to the Holy Prophet and I indicated with my hand that she was short. The Holy Prophet immediately reprimanded me. She said, this is Riva. She said, but she is short. I said, yes, but you said it in a manner trying to demean it, you know, uh, demean that person. So this is not allowed. Uh, another issue that we really need to pay attention to in, in this regard is uh, going back to Khutbah Shabaniya. Ihfadu al sinatakum. Watch your language. Because without watching your language during this uh, month of fasting, change your environment is critical. If you, you, are asso uh, you have association and friends that they are not into controlling themselves and purifying themselves, change the group. Otherwise, you will follow the same herd before Ramadan that you, you follow it during Ramadan. If you're looking for change, uh, seek friends that they help you in your struggle and they are part of the process. See who, they, they, there is an expression that says, give me your friends and I tell you who you are. So make sure at least you begin from the beginning of the month to be mindful of all these friends that you have around you as a circle of social group. Are they helping you in this process of purification and controlling uh, or managing or main, or the, the tongue or not? If they are not, then stay away, change it. Uh, otherwise, you will be following the old herd exactly as you were before. You will commit the same sins that you were committing before because they uh, keep pushing you uh, towards the this, this sinfulness. Some of these I ideas that need to, uh, to, be, uh, to be borne in mind, the taming of the tongue is critical during the month of Ramadan. Particularly the silence part. Uh, change your lifestyle in which... Believe me, nothing is going to happen if you put your telephone, your gadget somewhere else and you don't respond to it for two, three, four hours. Yes, yeah, sometimes you have urgent work to do as part of your gadget and part of your work, but all this Facebook, 
uh, WhatsApp and everything else. I mean, you tell me what is the benefit of spending half an hour, 45 minutes, an hour checking the Facebook to, to listen or watch the comments made by others who said, I oh, yes, last night I went to a restaurant so and so and I ate this food or I um, um, had a gathering with so and so what? This is part of the knowledge that is not going to be benefiting me whatsoever, particularly during the month of Ramadan. What's up? It's a garbage that comes into my page and I dump it into somebody else's page and it goes around. Somebody has to step back and leave it. So this taming of the tongue will ultimately help us to control the, the ailment that we have as a consequence of the tongue. You don't need to suddenly have a quantum leap and make an attempt to get rid of the entire shortcomings of the tongue. Focus on one. Say, backbiting. And you break the time during the day into segments. I promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'm going to be mindful of my behavior within the next two hours and stay away, constantly reminding yourself any way or shape of your form that you can, sticking papers around uh, in front of your library, opening a book and the notes are there, on the fridge, whatever, just constant reminder on your laptop, on your computer, mind your language, watch. This way, slowly, slowly, you get into a breaking habit. And once you have broken the habit, then you can replace it. Because our major problem during the month of Ramadan, the first one is to remove all the habits, bad habits. Then replace them one by one. So start with one. The one that you are habitually problematic for you. And remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is keeping an eye on our behavior. One of the hadith from Imam Hussein sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Somebody came to Imam Hussein and said, Ya Abda Rasulullah, I'm a habitual liar. I can't stop lying. Look at the approach that Imam chooses. He said, no problem. But remember five things. The first one, you are benefiting from Allah's mercy in your life. Go somewhere where Allah's mercy is not there, then af'al ma Go somewhere that you are not benefiting from the mercy of Allah, then you can do whatever you want. Number two, remember that Allah keeping an eye on you. Go somewhere that is Allah is not there, then you can do af'al ma Third, when uh, uh, Israel comes and tells you, let's go, say, no, you go, I'll stay here, I will come whenever I like. Then you can do whatever you want. When the Malakan al Muqarraban, the two angels come and they say, ask you about what you have done, say, mind your business, I'll, I'll stay, I'll deal my own, my own work. And when on the day of judgment you are resurrected and you stand before the sacred court, don't answer anything. If you can't do any of these fives, then mind how you behave. Another one, in following up to the environment, as you move away from bad uh, associates, replace them with good associates. This is why Mujalasatul Ulama and scholars and so on uh, in, in the month of Ramadan is so re highly recommended. There is a hadith from Prophet Isa alayhi salatu uh, wasalam. One of his followers asked, Man Nujalis, whom should we associate? The, the, uh, Prophet Isa said, You should associate with somebody that ru'yatuhu yudakkirukum billah. When you look at this person, the image that this person has reminds you of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Two, amaluhu amalun salih, and he has good deed and encourages you to think about akhirah. 
ويزيد في عملكم منطقة the rationale of his behavior encourages you to do more and more good deeds. These are things that, I mean, because of the shortness of the time, we have to uh, quickly wrap it up. But these are things that we really need to pay attention to. Ailment of the tongue is extremely dangerous if we don't pay attention to them and we don't tame the tongue and this beast out of control ultimately ruins uh, our life. Uh, let's, as, as we get to the end, let's make dua uh, that uh, the most, for the rest of the month of Ramadan, inshallah, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the privilege of remaining on the right path and being able to purify our own souls and our own hearts and uh, somehow being able to move out of the chain uh, of material life and particularly tame, being able to tame our language, even partially, it's better than nothing at all. That, that's tonight is the night, uh, the uh, Thursday night, Laylatul Jum'ah. End with the recitation of Surah Al-Fatiha ala ruh arwah mu'minin wal mu'minat wa shuhada jami'an qabla as-salat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. There are two questions. Thank you for the uh, lecture, mashallah. So one question is for the especially for the kids who are going to school and uh, even for people who are going to the offices. So what is what is your suggestion? How do we can fulfill the Sohar and Asr prayer on time if, if we are if kids are going to the school or for example? Well, Dhuhr and Asr prayers. It's not just applies to the younger brothers and sisters, applies to the more senior members as well. You need to see how your work schedule uh, is and whether you can take time off for the prayer. Sometimes that possibility exists, sometimes it doesn't. If the possibility exists, then naturally we try to organize a prayer at the time of Fadila, which is early on uh, for each of Dhor and Asri. If the possibility doesn't exist, then we have to organize the time, the earliest possible time uh, that we can do it. For the children, the same, if their classes are organized in such a way that during, say, one o'clock, which is the prayer time, they have a class. You can't, they cannot come out of the class and the school doesn't allow them. Unlike some religious schools that they structure the class around the prayer, but they cannot come out, then their excuse is rational and justifiable. They have to wait until the class is over and the first break that they have, they can organize the prayer then. So the time of Fadila uh, is uh, recommended if possible to organize the prayer at that time. If not possible for whatever reason, then we can do it a little bit later. Yes, I'm... Um, so, uh, I have a question about namaz, like you were saying. Um, when we do read namaz, what's a good, like, clean, way, clean place that we can read namaz? Uh, an excellent question, particularly these days when our houses are, might not be clean. Normally, uh, people designate or make a particular corner of the house or one room, school, find, speak to your teachers and find an office, some kind of an office or even a classroom that they would allow you to get yourself your sajjadas and so on and do your prayer over there. Normally when you speak, if two, a number of Muslim students are within the school and they all approach the principal or assistant principal and they say, it's the month of Ramadan, we need to do our prayer uh, as early as possible. Can we use one of the empty rooms that you have? Like library? Where, wherever, yeah. A library or any other room that it's empty and uh, do our prayers. Normally they would respond positive, but you, and you need to approach them. No. Um, so I have a question. Uh, 
have a question is from the ladies uh, because this is the month of Ramadan. Uh, our sisters are trying to keep the poor, but they are in the fasting. And uh, let's say, for example, they wanted to, to, they don't know, like, what's the spice level, what's the salt level in the, uh, the food that they have cooked. No. <laughs> so, so what is, uh, like, they, they wanted to taste it, like, but they are in uh, uh, the fasting. So is there any... Any way that we can do that or... I saw on Siftar many years ago from Ayatollah Sistani's office that the, the person said, is it possible for me, as a, he was a chef or a cook, uh, that I have to cook for the restaurant and I need to uh, taste the food. Uh, is it possible for me to take a small spoon from the food and then just taste it but don't swallow anything and spit the whole thing out? Uh, Ayatollah Sistani said, yes, but you really need to uh, clean your mouth at least two or three times by spitting the whole thing so there is nothing left inside the mouth. It is possible, but uh, I think that's the only way we can do it without swallowing anything. Anything that is swallowed, then negate the fast. Yes, sir. Um, so you mentioned backbiting and that even when we are telling the truth, it is considered backbiting, otherwise it's considered trauma. So... No, when you be telling the truth, I mean, th there is a fact uh, when we're telling the fact, but the intention is to demean and uh, character assassinate the person. That's the critical part. So if the, the example that I gave you, the wife of the prophet said that she is short, she was short. But the way she expressed it, it was a way of uh, demeaning the character. That was the part. So uh, when Abadar said, Yap, Ya Rasulullah, but if a person has this characteristic, and we say it, said, because you are saying it in the absence of the person, a person is not around to defend himself or herself. And this is done with an intention of demeaning the character or assassinate the character. This is why it's not allowed. There are some circumstances where uh, the, the saying facts about other people uh, becomes permissible, but that's nothing to do with him. As long as you're not intending to do it. Yes. Uh, that, for example, if somebody comes to you uh, and says that my daughter's hand is going to be, uh, has been asked by so and so, what do you know about this character? Then I have to inform them whatever I know. Uh, it's not. It's, it's now the, the circumstances are different from just character assassination of the meat. There are no questions to spare. Let's go. Okay. Oh. It's really good. It's a really good Bismillah ar rahman ar rahim Bismillah ar rahim Assalamu Assalamu alaikum Ibrahim Khalilullah. Assalamu alaikum Musa Kalimullah. Assalamu alaikum ya warasa Isa Ruhillah. Assalamu alaikum ya warasa Muhammadin Habibullah. Assalamu alaikum ya warasa Amir al Mu'minin Waliyullah. Assalamu alaikum ya war. Assalamu alaikum ya abna Muhammadin al Mustafa. Assalamu alaikum ya abna Aliyin al Murtada. Assalamu alaikum ya abna Fatima al Zahra ya Sayyida al Nisa al Alamin. Assalamu alaikum ya ibn Khadija al-Kubra Assalamu alaikum ya sar Allah wa ibn al-Sarihi wal witr al-Mawtur ashhadu annaka qad qamta as-salat wa atayta az-zakat wa amarta bil ma'ruf wa nahaytan al-munkar wa taala Allah rasuluhu hatta taqul yaqeen falan Allah ummatan qatalatka falan Allah ummatan zalamatka 
محمد والے محمد ون سورہ فاتحہ is requested for سلیم علی بلگم والا سن آف محمد